for joining us. Now, over the past several weeks, we've watched some interesting situations unfold. Last week, we discussed uh, in our team and a lot in the countryside, do we have live or dead plants, and, and how do we determine that? A lot of concern in the countryside that our plants were actually dying off. We've since recognized that that's most likely not the case. So what, I'm, what I've pulled up here and I'm showing the, the audience is a PDF document that we will be sharing with everybody through the VitaPlus Dairy Performance blog after the webinar today. But what we talked about last week in determining if the plant's alive or dead in physiological status is looking at the ear leaf on the corn plant. So as the plant dries or dies from the top and from the bottom, and many of us have seen some of our fields started turning brown and we've been worried that the plants are actually dying. However, if there's any green left in the plant, that plant is still alive. And you can see the ear leaf here that's highlighted uh, with this red arrow will be the last ear, or the last leaf on the plant to die, and that supplies all the energy for the ear. So if that ear is still green, our plants are alive. And in most situations, our plants are still alive. So now that brings us to where we're at this week in have we pollinated or not. We're at a turning point here, and all of our management decisions are going to hinge on what the plant is doing from a pollination status. There's a couple different ways we can determine whether the plant's pollinated, and one is by the silk test which I'd invite you to go look at uh, a YouTube video from Professor Joe Lauer at the University of Wisconsin, this web link here, and it'll also be some materials that we'll have at the back end of the presentation we'll share. You can also assess grain f uh, fill in another couple weeks when the ear starts to, to blister, and you'll be able to see the number of ears. But really, that with uh, tasseling and pollination, roughly 50 to 70% completed throughout much of the Midwest, we're at a turning point here. We're a little bit early to assess what the status of the crop is on a whole, but we're starting to get some information coming across, and it looks like um, in some cases we're pollinating fairly normally. In, uh, for example, in Dane County in southern Wisconsin, looks like fairly normal pollination in much of the fields and in some research plots, but there are also some other areas that are 20 to 25 percent where the fields are going to be barren, and it doesn't look like pollination was successful. So we're at a critical junction here, and we're going to talk about how to determine uh, pollination, pollination status, and then what the management decisions we should, uh, what directions we should go after determining whether we pollinated or not, and what are some of the different things we can expect, and how can we proceed forward. So with that, I'm now going to pass controls over to my colleague, uh, Chris, and she will move us forward into the rest of, uh, or the second half of the seminar. Chris, you should be ready to roll. Thank you, John. Um, are you seeing my screen? Not quite yet. Are there any questions coming in while we get that transferred over? No, we, we don't have any questions. And again, if anybody has anything all the way throughout the webinar today, use the question box. There we go. Got her now? Yep. Um, just as John talked about, thank you, John. Um, Really, I'm going to talk here about um, harvest, moistures, and fermentation, and then I'll pass it back over to John and Randy. But really, pollination will determine which direction um, that we take. Um, if it pollinates, if that plant pollinates, really it's an easy decision. Um, we're going to let that plant mature. Um, it has the ability to increase starch. Um, let me we have the ability to minimize or to increase starch to increase yield, so it's an easy decision. We're going to let that plant mature. If it dis doesn't pollinate, like John said, like we're seeing some fields um, look like they're going to be barren, then really um, we have another decision. Is that plant alive? John did a nice job of just talking about if it's alive or not. Um, if it's alive, the second decision to ask is, um, are you going to be planting another crop, um, either an emergency crop because you need some um, more forage behind that? Um, if the answer is yes, um, you may want to make the decision to mow and wilt that crop to your desired moisture and then harvest it. Um, if the decision is no, that you are not going to plant another crop behind that, um, you can mow and wilt 
um, but I would probably advise against doing that if you can avoid that. Um, adding some ash and some dirt into it can affect the fermentation process. Um, so preferably we'd like to just monitor that moisture and chop in at um, 62 to 68 um, percent. That plant, if we continue to get some spotty showers and because the plant's got been bred um, for drought resistance, it's very likely that a lot of these plants will not dry down to that moisture until they hit a killing frost. Um, so again, some of you may make the decision to mow and wilt it based on when your custom um, harvester can get into that field. Um, um, so are they hearing me? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so you may make that decision based on when your custom harvester can get into the field. If the plant is dead, you're going to want to monitor again the moisture and chop when it hits 68, 62 to 68% um, if you have enough plant material there to harvest. The most common mistake that we see made when we're working with drought stress crops in areas is people going in See in a field like you're seeing here, this is a field out of southeast Wisconsin um, taken just recently. They look at this field and if you don't know anything about plant physiology, um, they go in and they panic and they start chopping these fields. And we've seen this in past years um, and we've seen it um, this year already. And we're hearing estimates of silage coming in at in the high 70s and low 80s. These mistakes are being made. Visual estimates of moistures are highly inaccurate. Um, with the drought resistance that we've bred into these plants, that curling of the leaves and that browning up of the leaves is the plant's effort to conserve moisture. And that moisture is primarily located in the stock of the plant. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people that are going into the, the fields, um, chopping it off because it looks like this. And this particular field actually tested in the high 70s for moisture and getting very wet for wet forage that's leaching out sugars out of the bunkers already. So you need to monitor those moistures. And Chris, I will point out too on that picture that we just had up, you all you will all notice how there was some green left in those plants and that was the ear leaf that we were talking about before. So those plants are still alive and in the event that we get a significant rainfall event, say one, two, to three inches like some of the, the southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois and Indiana, Ohio areas got, that plant may pull out of that. And in fact, um, from what I've heard from reports where we saw some widespread rain, particularly in the northern um, part of the Corn Belt here early this week, um, the people have been, the comments have been, they've been amazed how much that plant has changed in a day or two. So we are seeing that. So it's important to assess if that plant is alive or not. You're going to need, based on past experience, you're going to need to monitor that moisture often. Um, you're going to need to look at different maturities, um, different planting populations, what your field conditions are in hybrids. You're going to need to test that moisture a lot. Variation, as opposed to a lot of years with corn silage, variation is going to be the norm. I've found when we've had drought in areas in the past that once we get close on moisture, it's really difficult to assess these variable fields by just pulling a few plants and guessing if you've got a representative sample. Um, if you can, the best way that I've found to get um, a moisture is to run a field chopper through that field for more accuracy, pull a composite sample, and either send it into the lab or run it on a cost or tester. Um, it's just extremely hard to get an accurate moisture when you're just pulling a few plants particular in a drought year. Again, um, hybrid maturity, how much drought tolerance that plant has, um, plant health, and we're seeing some significant insect pressure in some areas with these dry conditions. They all are going to influence your harvest time significantly and you're just, you or your nutritionist or field person are going to need to monitor that moisture closely. Our recommendations for moisture are pretty similar to normal corn silage, but we're going to slide a little drier. I'm seeing some moisture recommendations that are still at 70 percent. Um, we're recommending targeting 62 to 68 percent moisture um, for this corn silage. Um, and here's the reason. Um, immature corn silage, 
that does not have a significant amount of ear or starch in it, harvesting it wet is going to result in very high acid, high acetic acid fermentations. Um, we've seen it time and time again. For those of you that have bunkers and piles, when you need to start harvesting in a little higher moisture, think about that yellow, greenish, puke-colored corn silage at the bottom of your um, pile. That's the stuff that we're talking about. Um, in those areas that have had drought and have went early, made that mistake of harvesting it too wet, not only are you losing nutrients because your sugars are running off in that effluent, but we've had intake problems with the cows. Um, and we've also, because of some of the compounds that are produced in these silages, had some health problems and particularly transition cow problems on this silage. So I'd highly advise you to stay away from harvesting this immature corn silage without corn um, on the wet side. Additionally, just looking at what our summer has been with these extreme heat, um, this extreme heat, um, and selling at high temperatures, we've got data out of is, uh, direct scientific stuff out of Israel and Brazil and some of the hotter parts of the United States. Um, temperatures that are in the high 80s and above are very difficult to, it's very difficult to control the fermentation. And we get some fermentation and some compounds in those fermentations that are extremely um, difficult, to, um, difficult to control, like I said, and the cows don't perform very well in some of those silages. On the flip side, obviously harvesting too dry will restrict our fermentation and compromise packing and aerobic stability or feed out of that corn silage. So once moistures have dressed, begin to drop, watch it carefully. Um, we've seen this drought stressed corn silage drop as much as one to three points a day under certain circumstances. Um, personal experience has also said if we get some hot, um, dry days where we get some extreme wind, it's like turning a hairdryer onto that corn silage field. Um, I've seen it drop as much as four. And I've heard reports as much as six, seven points a day. So it can go so pretty fast on you in those conditions. Um, if it rains when harvest is close or happening, um, like John said, if it's pollinated, um, the plant is amazing. Um, it'll pull that moisture back up into that plant. Um, it'll pull it up into that ear. And we've actually been, when we've been close to chopping, close to 65% moisture, actually seen that plant recover and pull a ton or two a ton more yield per acre. Um, if we've got kind of a timely rain here, close to timely rain. Hey, Chris. You're getting a, yep. Um, there, we got a hand raised out there, so I thought maybe we could uh, unmute Jim to see if he's got a question a minute. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Jim Dickerel with Dirty Day. You were talking about uh, harvesting at high temps. Could you say again what what kind of, you know, temperatures in excess of 85 degrees or what are you looking at there? It, it's a little dependent on um, how long you're going to be harvesting, but the data that we are starting to see is we're looking at other compounds. We're measuring other compounds in the fermentation profile other than the standard lactic and acetic. What we're seeing is it's very hard when we're at high temperatures to, quote, kind of control that fermentation. And we get a lot of bacteria populations that actually kind of just go wild and take over. And we will see some compounds produced, some alcohol compounds, some ethanol compounds that combine with things like lactic and acetic and just cause some challenges on the cow end as well as with the fermentation. And if you want me to elaborate on that some more, I mean, we've seen that in the field personally as well. If you want me, you can contact me afterwards, Jim, and we can discuss that. We've got another hand raised here with a our second Jim. Jim, are you there? Jim Duven? Do we have a question yet? Okay, we'll let that one go and raise your hand again, Jim, if you have a, a question again here in 
we don't mean to ignore you. Sorry, Chris. Nope, no problem. Um, we want to take um, any pertinent questions here. So, and I'll encourage you to write it in the chat box if the hand raising isn't working. Um, so if it rains, again, like I said, um, the plant can pull up some significant moisture if it's still alive. Um, we've been getting um, significant questions on nitrates. It's been a long time since we've been worried in this big of an area about nitrates. Um, if it rains like it did here just recently in some of the Corn Belt, um, even if it's a small amount, you're going to want to wait if you can five to seven days after that rain because high nitrates are likely at that point in time. Really, with high nitrates, there's two issues. Um, I'm not going to go over any of the animal or human issues in, in depth. Um, there's plenty written out there, and if you've got more questions, we can talk about them later. But we have issues with animals, ingestion, nitrate poisoning. Um, the second issue I just want um, to caution all of you that are out there working with silage is with drought conditions. We have a higher incidence of silo gases and possibility of um, getting nitrate poisoning and respiratory problems from that. So I'd encourage you to kind of review all of um, your safety recommendations out there. Chris, can um, you comment quickly this, at about what temperature the fermentation might be affected, uh, sort of a cut point? Sorry to interrupt you. Um, it'll be a little bit variable because it'll depend on a lot of environmental conditions. But if I had to cut it off, and there's not a lot of research on what the cutoff point on, on the temperature is, I would say based on stuff that we've done in Indiana, in particular work in Indiana and parts of Illinois, that above 85 degrees. When we get in the 80s, um, particularly for those of you that are, are putting up piles, large piles and bunkers and taking several days to fill and we're not getting it aerobic very quickly, um, we're smelling and seeing some of those compounds produced. And there's some new tests that will be coming out, I believe, looking at some of those compounds. Thank you. Okay, anything else, John? No, nope, that's it for now. I put this slide in here just as a caution. Um, corn obviously isn't the only nitrate accumulator. Um, sorghum, sedangrass, those of you that have already maybe chopped some fields off and planted another crop like sorghum or sedan, um, they're common nitrate accumulators. As well as those of you that are going to be chopping off some grain here, particularly in northern Corn Belt, and putting in some small grains as well as some weeds are common nitrate accumulators. And this is all-inclusive, so if you have high nitrates in your water, you're going to want to work with your nutritionist on what nitrate levels might, you might be able to feed. Here's the environmental causes, or the common environmental causes of nitrates, and you can see um, why we're concerned about it this year. Um, rain after a period of drought, an extremely stressed crop, so thanks short crop, we'll have the potential for higher nitrates, um, weather extremes, and with corn, obviously, high nitrogen field applications, whether that's manure or commercial fertilizer, will cause or have the potential to cause higher nitrates. It's a normal process. Nitrates are pulled up by the plant um, to incorporate into plant amino acids and protein co um, compounds. And just like the growth of the plant, drought slows, slows that process. Most of the nitrates accumulate in the lower stock. So because the nitrates accumulate in that lower third of the stock, the common recommendation is that you will see is to raise that cutter bar. Um, my experience would say it's really difficult to go look at a field that's short already, low on yield, and we're looking for forage for those cows or for our livestock. Um, it's really hard to tell somebody that they need to chop higher. So in general, 30 to 60 percent of the nitrates will be lost through the fermentation process. So if you take this corn silage or this corn and put it up as silage, um, a good part of the nitrates will be lost through the fermentation process. In fact, I have very seldom um, run into a high nitrate well ferment corn silage. The recommendation is to wait at least three to four weeks for this process to happen. Um, that being said, I'm recommending testing anything that you're suspicious about or that's been under drought stress at this 
time. Um, it is about eight, talking to the commercial ads, about eight to ten bucks. So that test is relatively cheap, and it's cheap, cheap insurance against nitrates. Um, inoculation definitely has been shown to help to reduce the levels, possibly about 10% more. I throw this chart up, not because I'm going to um, go over it, but at about 1,000 um, parts per million of nitrate is when we start to be concerned about it. There are ways to feed some high nitrate forages, um, work with your nutritionist or um, contact us on how to do that. Um, I talked to Commercial Lab yesterday, about a third of the fresh corn plants that are coming in right now to their lab are testing over a thousand parts per million of nitrate. So that's just recent information. I was surprised at the level um, and it may be a select group of plants at this point. Um, just a couple additional um, thoughts. Every year we hear, and I've heard of two instances, at least in Indiana, we hear of people turning cows, might be beef cows out to st graze stressed corn silage without testing for nitrates, or they go out and green chop, and um, they go in a little bit later and all the animals are dead. I've heard of two instances this year, I'm sure there's plenty more, so don't do that. My advice is don't do it, um, but if you're going to try it, make sure that you test for nitrates. And I'll also caution you, if you're going to do that test load, like I said, to try and determine moisture, be careful about feeding that as well. In southern Illinois and parts of Indiana, we have already um, taken some corn that did not tassel off. Um, and some of that was baled as dry corn. I don't know if I call that corn stalks or corn plants, but it was dried down, mold wilted, and baled. Um, remember, it's a fermentation process that we're talking about here that'll drop nitrates. So those, those bales could have the potential to test high in nitrates. I'm just going to talk real briefly about inoculants here and moisture. Um, UV light isn't good for people and it isn't good for the natural bacterial population that we may normally rely on for fermentation of the corn silage. Um, we know that it's highly likely that the natural bacterial population has got knocked back in this stressed corn silage. And so even people that normally say you don't need inoculant on corn silage are recommending inoculants this year. Um, our recommendation is to use a normal, um, quick, upfront fermenting bug. Um, we use the MTD-1 at a normal rate. I'm hearing some people kind of take the opportunity, some competitors, to say you need to double the rate. Um, so if you normally use about 100,000 colony forming units per gram of forage, they're saying just double that application rate. Um, I'm going to tell you that that's really not going to do anything doubling that rate, you would need to go more like five or ten times that rate to really see an increase in that fermentation efficiency. Um, so that is not our recommendation, just apply it at a normal rate. However, I'll say we also don't want to under-apply it, so this is a year that you definitely want to check your application rates and make sure you're getting the right amount on. So, if plant moisture is above 65%, we're just recommending a good upfront fermenting bug. Um, if you've got some excessive damage to that plant, um, insect damage, some plant damage, or maybe you're concerned that that excess sugar next year in the heat is going to have some stability problems, I mean, you can put a Buchneri organism, we've got Krapenrich stage 2, or add a Buchneri to your regular homofermentive inoculant. I will caution you, we've worked with um, the Buchenry product actually even before it was approved on the marketplace. Um, we believe in it. But in this immature corn, with, without any grain in it, um, the Buchenry, I would not be looking at probably putting it on anything that I think somebody might be going and putting it wet. And I'll qualify that at about 60% or above. Occasionally, not always at those kind of wet, immature forages, we'll see that bug kind of go wild and produce a lot of acetic acid. And so I'd maybe stay away from those kind of situations with Buchneri. Below 65%, and 
like I said, we'll see some of this um, either because it drops extremely quick in moisture if this drought continues or possibly you can't get the custom harvester there when you need them to. Um, don't panic. Um, chop it finer to get that oxygen out of that uh, whatever storage structure that you're using. Um, pack it aggressively. Um, I've upped, put two or you know one or two more pack tractors on there and cover it quickly and a lot of times you may get a pretty good fermentation and be able to keep it. Um, if it gets below that 65 percent you may want to consider maybe narrowing up your face or looking at that feed out rate. And again, in those cases, then I'd definitely be looking at putting a buchnerai organism on those dry forages for feed out. So as I wind up here, I've got a couple other considerations just to kind of keep in the back of your mind before I pass the torch here back to John. Um, if you're working with a custom harvester, here's my recommendation. Keep them in the loop on your moistures and the current status of your fields. And they've been talking to the custom harvesters, and I know a couple of them have actually went out and put another forage harvester um, into their lineup because they're getting inundated with calls from people that want to put their corn. They know it's not going to um, make, it's not going to ear out for them. They're not going to get grain and they're going to want it chopped. So hopefully you have a good relationship with your custom harvester. You've been a client for a while, but keep them in the loop. Um, the wor worst thing you can do to them right now is tell them, our corn's dry, you got to come over and chop it and they chop it and it's sitting at 78 or 80 percent moisture and they've just hauled all their equipment into your field and now you're telling them, nope, we can't go, you need to go somewhere else and they've spent that time moving the equipment. If you're chopping it yourself, obviously get your equipment and order your staff ready and be ready to go at a moment's notice. And the last thing that I have before I pass it to John is um, we're doing a lot of forage inventories right now, a lot of planning. I know Vita Plus staff um, are working with our clients here, getting um, where we're at, what we're going to need, and um, how we're going to um, work in the next year so that we have enough forage and talking to some of our neighbors that maybe won't, won't be marketing grain this year. So with that, um, if there aren't any questions, I'll pass the torch back over to John Gazer, Dr. John Gazer. Thanks, Chris. You just bring up those couple bullet points there, and, and we'll transition over to Randy quickly. I wanted to interject some energy or quality discussion as well. I, I know there's a lot of concern about what sort of value corn silage will have, and, and Randy's going to do a great job answering that for us here in a second. But the I, I, I've seen probably 15 to 25 drought-stressed silage samples come through uh, the labs that we work with here, and I guess I can. Jump back here and I'll, I'll take control. Excuse our delay here. Okay. So I, want, I just wanted to comment about the energy value here, and, and what I've done is we have a normal corn silage value down here. You can see the, the fiber level and protein value. So with drought stress corn silage, since we're not going to have the starch and not going to have the ear, we're going to have a little bit higher fiber percentage of that plant, and our protein will also be higher as well. However, with our drought stress corn, we're seeing a little bit, uh, a little bit to substantially higher fiber digestibilities this year. There's just not a big ear for that plant to hold up in the air. So there's not as much lignification going on. And actually, we're having some decently moderate energy levels. So I calculated these energy values um, by hand and then also predicted a, a milk level uh, just for a generic farm. So you can see we're probably going to be sitting uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of maybe 65 to 85 percent the value of normal corn silage energy. And um, you know, don't think that your dairy is going to be uh, dropping this much in milk. That won't be the case. Your nutritionist will work around this stuff. However, you can see what type of milk loss you could expect if you were feeding this uh, full bore and, uh, as compared to normal corn silage. So a little bit of comparison on the quality side and what sort of energy and value this might have, and then we'll transition over and discuss what sort of economic value this might have and uh, how we might price it standing in the field. So I'm going to make Randy the presenter now. Randy, you're free to take it away and take over from here. Okay, thanks, John. 
Uh, so yeah, I, John talked a little bit about what the feeding value might end up being as far as trying to get milk out of uh, this corn silage, and obviously a lot of variation around the crop this year, uh, depending on your geography and a lot of other things too. Um, I'm going to talk about more, not we're not going to guess what the value of feeding is going to be, but uh, what's the pricing situation like and just some guidelines out there. We don't have a lot of uh, slides here, but we'll go through a few. And uh, when I step back and think about this, um, you think about what could we feed the cows, right? I guess I put the straw, a wheat straw on one end of the spectrum. Uh, it's about as high a fiber product and is about as indigestible a forage as we can get our hands on. At the under, other end of the spectrum, uh, you got good, well-eared uh, corn silage like most of us put up last year. Uh, straw, uh, coming out of the field again, unharvested, which is what most of the requests were getting, what standing corn silage worth, what, you know, before harvesting it. Um, so I tried to make the comparison with wheat straw in the field in my area, um, you know, unharvested. Wheat straw laying in the field is running about 65 bucks a ton. Uh, I still got to go out with a baler or the chopper and, and uh, store it uh, as well. Um, you go to the other end of the spectrum, if you, if you use the uh, $7 times the seven or seven and a half times the price of corn and adjusted to dry matter in a normal year, that's kind of the multiplier that we use for standing corn silage. We'd be at 160 bucks a ton of dry matter. Uh, so uh, some of this drought stress stuff uh, for this year, um, it's going to fall between those two points, all right? And it, it's going to depend where you're at. Um, there's going to be a lot of different looking stuff, okay? It could be some shorter plants that have ears, or it could be some really big plants that don't have ears. So there's going to be a lot of variation, even around the, the guidelines that I'm going to show you here in a couple slides. Uh, Mike Hutchins did a couple webinars, I think, for hordes last week, one of them. Uh, he quoted a price of uh, an estimate somewhere between $90 and $150 a ton of dry matter for this drought stress corn silage. Again, pretty big range there. Um, and still need to figure out uh, what price to offer and what's a fair price and that kind of thing. So uh, John kind of threw out that guideline as well, 65 to 85 percent of regular corn silage. Um, still need some more uh, guidelines and, and how to figure it out. So I basically took two approaches. Um, if it's corn that is absolutely does not have grain, okay, and you almost have to think about uh, the situation from the grower's perspective to give you a little guidance here. If I'm growing corn and I'm, I had planned on combining it and selling it for grain this fall, if now that crop has zero potential for grain, uh, you really need to price the stuff as a grass hay or grass silage product. Uh, if they still have the option to harvest it, you know, and pull off 30 or 50 bushels of corn per the acre, then you can can make some estimates on the grain value and price it as corn silage. So I'm going to walk through uh, both scenarios here quickly. If we're talking about some stuff that's absolutely not an option for grain, um, we're going to price it again as either a grass or a small grain hay or silage. <clears throat> it's basically a total loss for the grain producer except for you know their option is still to uh, plow it under and use it as fertilizer and typically that value right now is going to be about fifteen to twenty dollars per ton of dry matter uh, for the corn crop that's on the field. Um, otherwise you're really looking at pricing it at the local hay market um, and I put a dollar to a dollar thirty per point of relative feed value or relative feed quality uh, as my range in my local area um, in south central Wisconsin here um, and it might very well depend on your area what, what hay is going for, and you might have to adjust that price. Okay, um, and you obviously then have to adjust it for dry matter. That that buck to a buck thirty per point is at a hundred percent dry matter, um, so that's got to be calculated down. Um, and typically, when you're talking about a buck to a buck thirty per point relative p value for hay, <clears throat> that hay is harvested and delivered to the farm. So we've got to include the those variables when we're figuring these numbers out. So let's just go through an example. I uh, did pull a sample, and we've seen several. Um, this one happens to be from uh, South Central Illinois that basically had no starch in it. Um, so the numbers on the silage were 
29.34% uh, dry matter, almost 30% dry matter, a little on the wet side, um, like Chris was talking about, 70.5% uh, NDF. So that's the bulk of the dry matter is made up from fiber. And the, I just put S plus S is starch plus sugar in the sample. It's only five under 6% of the dry matter is starch or sugar. So basically no grain in this stuff at all. Um, you can use your ADF and NDF numbers if your lab report doesn't get it to calculate the relative feed value. There's, there's ways to find that out out on the internet. Uh, we've got spreadsheets available too if you got, need some help with that. But the relative feed value of this silage calculates out at 79. Okay, and I just picked a buck and a quarter. So a buck and a quarter times 79 uh, gives me $98.75 a ton uh, on a 100% dry matter basis as the value for this silage. Um, then I've got to bring it down to the dry matter that it's at. So at, at, on an as-fed basis, the stuff is worth about 29 bucks a ton standing in the field or, or harvested. Okay, so that's the other adjustment we have to make. And what's harvest going to cost this year? Uh, there's a lot of guesses too. Uh, a lot of your, your harvesters are charging by the by the hour these days, and uh, so you tell me, depending on the field again, how many tons per acre and how fast can they shove it through the chopper? Uh, I've heard estimates uh, that you know costs per ton to harvest are going to be double or triple this year, uh, again depending on yields. So I took I just put a number in there at nine bucks a ton. Let's say it's going to cost us nine bucks a ton. That gets us right down to uh, 20 bucks a ton standing in the field on a wet basis that this stuff uh, might be worth. Randy, okay. can I add a One comment example? in here that, yes, that, please. I, that I forgot to mention before? We talked about some samples we'd seen come through uh, the labs already, and you've got a, an example here in the pricing equation. I want to point out that if you are sampling some plants that, that are going to be used to price standing corn silage or it, there's going to be a, a larger economic um, transaction based on some sample sampling, I'd encourage you to do wet chemistry analysis. Pay the little bit extra and have the labs run wet chemistry uh, analyses for you on the silage samples uh, in negotiations. We have seen some significant differences between NIR, quick lower cost analyses, and the wet chem reports reported back by the forage analysis labs early on in this season. It, will probably take the labs another month or two of seeing quite a few more samples to get their NIR equations and uh, analyses dialed in. So again, I would steer you towards wet chemistry analysis uh, if you're going to be paying based on quality. John, would you expect uh, one or the other to be higher, like uh, like in starch or sugar? I mean, would you expect the wet chems to show higher sugar numbers than the NIR would? Uh, from a sugar standpoint, I don't know that we're we have enough enough results in yet to to uh, make that assessment. However, I, the comparisons I think three to five comparisons we've done on the fiber side have shown higher fiber than what the NIR was predicting. So in that situation, if if for example we had a 60% fiber, but in reality it was 65%, well that's going to have a significant impact on the RFV, and the 65% fiber uh, will indeed have a lower RFV. So again, if you're using RFV to price this stuff we've seen the wet chems come back a little bit lower quality than what the NIR has predicted. Yep. And I, I would second that, and, and uh, Andy, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, but uh, if you're using a, a sample uh, analysis of the forage to, to determine the price, I would definitely recommend doing it a wet chem analysis. Okay? And probably when we get to feeding the stuff, uh, we'll be doing that as well. Maybe they'll have some NIR stuff by then. It's a little more reliable, but there's going to be so much variation that uh, there's going to be a lot of wet chem analyses done on this stuff. Fair, John? Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay. Then uh, the other option, of course, is to price it as corn silage. Uh, and this, again, I'm going to tell you is for something that, that the grower has the option yet to harvest as grain. Yields could be very low, but they still have the option uh, to hold it for grain and uh, you know let it dry down and harvest it as grain. So I'm going to flip over to UW spreadsheet um, that they've got out there. And if you're looking for a copy, uh, our Vita Plus staff will have it in their hands, or else it's on the UW's uh, team forage site as well. And it's a good spreadsheet. I, I found it to be one of the best ones. 
that I've used uh, because it actually walks down two paths. Uh, it looks from the perspective of the grower and then from the buyer as well. Uh, so here's the spreadsheet. Um, up top, everything is uh, really starts with, and this is why it wouldn't be good for something with zero grain. Um, it needs a, a, a bushels per acre estimate uh, to start the ball rolling. Uh, it also needs a, a dry matter percentage on the silage. Um, so for this example that I'm going to walk down, um, we're going to use 30 bushels per acre. Okay, so hopefully it's on the low side um, and 35% dry matter, 65% moisture silage. Okay, the spreadsheet will predict uh, wet tons per acre. And in this case, at 30 bushel uh, corn, it's saying you're going to get 7.3 tons of wet silage off an acre. Um, so then, down here, if, it'll start going down vertically here, okay? So um, this column will follow from the seller's perspective how much is their crop worth to them, okay? I put, uh, believe it or not, a price of $8.20 on a bushel of corn, okay? So if I, I'm looking at my crop and I know uh, for certain that I could get 30 bushels to the acre, and I know my selling price is 820. Um, my gross value of the corn crop is 246 dollars an acre. Okay. Then they're going to say, well, obviously you can't you can't just go off a of gross. Uh, if I'm going to harvest it for grain, there's some costs involved with that. Um, and so I've got some assumptions built in there. And and uh, if you get your hands on the spreadsheet, you can put your own exact numbers in there. But ultimately we're going to say uh, this 30 bushel uh, corn is going to cost us about $61 to get harvested. Okay, and that does include uh, trucking and drying costs as well as some storage assumptions and uh, the harvest and storage losses. Okay, so now we're down to uh, about 185 bucks an acre is the minimum value, um, and that's 25 bucks a ton. Of course, then they also have the value of the stover, which uh, they'd be keeping if they harvested it as grain and the value of the stover is based off of uh, some fertilizer values and given the numbers we've got plugged in here the value of the stover per acre is another 30 bucks an acre so if they get to add that back to their value they're up to 215 dollars an acre and that comes up to 29 dollars and 49 cents for a wet ton okay so then if we go back up to the top and find the dairyman that's thinking about uh, uh, what could I actually pay for this um, given the market conditions? Um, typically, they're going to end up with a higher value because if you go to any elevator, you're going to pay more for corn than what they're going to pay you for corn. Uh, so I used the 50 cent spread. That was uh, uh, one that was real here sometime this week. Who knows what it is today? Uh, but if uh, they could sell corn for 820, uh, you could buy it for 870. Okay. Then it asks you for a price. Uh, it's basically putting a, trying to put a value on Stover, um, some some of the Stover component here as well. It's basically asking you for a price of, of straw. I put $110 a ton in here, um, and because we're harvesting it earlier than we would let it, letting it go to black layer, there is some reduction in uh, bushels of corn that are in wet corn silage versus what there would be if it dried down. Uh, so we're going to make a little five bushel an acre uh, deduction there. Okay, so now, now that crop to us per acre as a dairyman is worth 344 bucks. But of course, we still have to harvest it. We go down here to silage harvest costs, and I made some assumptions here. I basically put seven dollars a ton on uh, for chopping, a buck a ton for hauling, um, and packing's kind of included there as well. So now we're up to 55 bucks a ton that we're going to take off of that because it's going to cost us that. Um, we're going to put some shrink on there because our product is going to shrink. <clears throat> so total harvest, harvest costs, uh, and and storage losses, we get to take about $113 off per acre. It's now down to the value to the dairyman. It's worth 230 bucks an acre. <clears throat> you can see how how close these end up getting. Uh, we're two bucks apart on the value per ton. So to the to the dairyman, it's worth 31.50. To the to the grain farmer that was thinking about selling it, he's at 29.50. I think uh, most reasonable adults could arrive at a uh, uh, fair price given those two fair estimates. Okay, uh, so there are a lot of uh, variables to get plugged in, but hey, that's the the real world, 
and given the variation out there, I would not be very comfortable saying, ah, you know, it's worth 30 bucks a ton. You know, uh, there's way too much variation in what's going on out there this year. Uh, so I would encourage you to work through a spreadsheet like this uh, to come up with the fair value on the stuff that you're working on. Okay, uh, let's see. So then I also, uh, <clears throat> being a boiler maker, uh, I'm glad the audio is not enabled so I don't hear any boos here, but I, uh, Purdue University down in Indiana also has a uh, spreadsheet available. And I, I just plugged a bunch of, uh, actually four different scenarios through both spreadsheets just, just to see uh, how different they would, would be and, and work back through some numbers. Okay, so here's our 30 bushels an acre number. Uh, our example here on the in the first column of the table examples that would relate to seven to eight as fed tons. Um, that's the range between the two spreadsheets, and uh, it would give you corn silage. It's about 20% starch. Okay, the UW spreadsheet said that stuff was worth $29 a ton. Purdue said 28. Okay, so uh, pretty close uh, estimate there. Then I bumped her up to 50 bushels to the acre. That says you're going to get 9 to 11 as fed tons per acre. It's going to be about 25% starch. UW said 40 bucks a ton. Purdue said 41. Um, so you can see pretty close agreement even as we move up to a little higher grain yields. It went to 75. Uh, it gives us 12 to 13 tons to the acre, 30% starch, and 48 and $50 is the value per ton. And these are all at $8 corn. And then uh, plugged in the 100 bushels per acre gives us 14 to 16 tons, 33% starch. The value gets up to 53 to 56. Beyond 100 uh, bushels an acre, um, the value per ton doesn't increase a whole lot. The the value per acre obviously does. So, Randy, quick question: Are we going to have these yeah. spreadsheets available for download somewhere? And I, I would reply, yeah, we'll get out with at least the web links and, and we'll contact and see if we can distribute these as well. Yeah, you if you've been registered here um, to the webinar, we can send a follow-up email with the links for sure uh, uh, to the spreadsheet or we'll just send you the spreadsheets. We'll figure that out after the case here and, and we can send you links to both of them as well. So, uh, Good question. And we will get that taken care of. Otherwise, of course, if you're working with your friendly local Vita Plus representative, they can, they'll do this work for you. Probably some more booze I'm not hearing, but that's okay. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, I would tell you, okay, um, you still got to use some common sense, okay? Straw is selling for 100 to 125 bucks a ton. Um, you're not going to get a whole lot of anything for free these days, okay? Maybe in your market area, there could be some spots where there's opportunity to actually come out ahead this year if you can find a buyer's market. Crop insurance payments to the grain guys are going to play a huge role in what they are willing to sell it for and uh, how easy this, uh, some of these silage acres are going to come by. Okay, And then ultimately supply and demand still rule. If you've got one grain guy surrounded by 10 big dairies, uh, I would guess that that drought stress corn silage is going to cost more uh, than in an area where the uh, the demographics are flipped. Um, so just keep that in mind. And uh, other than that, I think that's all I had, John. Great. And Randy, if you could just leave that slide up. We appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. We want to acknowledge uh, the contributions uh, not only of Chris, Randy, and, and myself and, and our experience and expertise, but also we've heavily referenced Professor Joe Lauer at the University of Wisconsin. Joe, uh, Professor Lauer has done a great job of posting um, daily, sometimes several times a day, different news and informative articles, and you, you can see his links here. We will include copies of those in a follow-up email to you. We also would like to reference the Vital Plus Dairy Performance blog and some resources that we've used today. Those will be available uh, there at that web link. And again, lastly, we'd like to thank you again for your time. Stay calm. I think we're going to be okay as we move forward through the end of the season, end of the growing season. It'll be a little bit of a different year, but we are not going to, um, not going to all quit in our businesses by any means. One last question we had coming across were if there were any suggestions as far as how shred ledge chop length might be affected through drought stress or some different processing. And Chris, feel free to jump in here as well. But one of the uh, unique things about shred ledge is hey, the John? particle length. Yes, go ahead. 
John? Yeah. Your audio is breaking up real bad. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't, Chris, if you're on, you maybe want to address the chop length question. You're yeah, for some reason the question's not coming through in mine, um, but um, I think the question, let's just see if I can find that. Yeah, the, the question, Randy, can you see the question? I can't, but I think the question was on chop length. On shredlage. On shredlage, you know, we don't have enough experience really with shredlage. I consider it in an experimental stage to be able to tell, but I'm going to say it probably follows with um, some of the pressing and chop length that we would follow with moisture. Um, so if we're going to be dry, we're obviously going to chop it a little bit shorter to get that pack. I think that's going to be true for um, for um, regular processed corn silage. Um, and then obviously at your normal chop length, if that's a half an inch or three quarters of an inch um, at normal corn silage moistures. The other question that's come out as I've been in the field is, what do we do? Do we need to process this drought stressed corn silage? Um, if it does not have any ear, I don't think that you need to um, have the processor in there or you just open the processor up and let those knives take care of chopping that um, forage. If it has um, some corn in it, um, you're going to need to see if the corn is fairly milky and, and young and you need to take that plant again. You may need not need to process that um, corn. Um, if we have a drought continuing in through the year um, and into late right before we harvest it and we get some small hard kernels, corn kernels, it's at that point where we may need to turn that processor down. But we've had um, some people comment that the processor is needed for the corn silage plant and I feel that that's unnecessary for the plant material itself. So just watch it and again variation is going to be the norm. You may need the processor for one field that has small hard kernels and you might go to the next hybrid or the next field and you'll be able to open it up. So you're going to need to have somebody on that farm watching that corn as it's come in and making those decisions. That'll be even more critical this year. And as, as far as, and hopefully my audio is working a little bit better, but using the processor to break up cobs even without corn or grain on them, there just won't be that much of a cob to deal with and, and I would not put the processor in in that situation. So I think that wraps it up. If there are any last questions, feel free to shoot them across, but we'll wrap up today. Again, appreciate your time, and we're here to help in whatever capacity we can. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, and Thank keep you. your heads up.